welcome to Israel. It's midnight from Jerusalem, our weekly virtual worship service, and it's a joint effort between the Congregation of the Word and loveisrael.org. Let's begin tonight with our call to worship from the book of Psalms and Psalm 44. So I invite you to take out your Bibles and look there with me. Psalm 44, we're going to begin in verse 7. Now in English, it's actually verse 6. Psalm 44 in the English, verse 6 in Hebrew, verse 7. We read here, Ki lo vekashti eftach. Vecharbi lo toshi eni, ki hoshatani mi tsarenu, umi san enu hevi shota, ve Elohim hi la lenu ko hayom, ve shemcha leolam no de sela. And let me translate that. For not with my bow I will trust, and my sword will not save me. For you have saved me from my enemies, and the ones who hate me you have put a shame. In God we will praise all day, and your name forever we will give thanks. Selah. Let's move now to another location in the Word of God, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, beginning with verse 4, for the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kavod, Machuto Leolam Ve'ed. V'yahavta et Adonai Elohecha, Be'ko Levavcha, Uv'ko Nafshecha, Uv'ko Meodecha. V'hayu Hadvarim Ha'ele Asher Anochi, Mitzvacha Hayom Al Levavecha. V'shinanetam Levanecha, V'debartem bam beshiftecha bevetacha uvlechtacha vaderk ukshak becha ukomecha ukshartam leot al yedecha vehayu le totafot ben anecha uftavtam al mizazot betacha uvesherecha. And now we'll go before our Lord in prayer. God, you are great, and your name is greatly to be praised. We are glad for opportunities to testify of our faith in you, to give thanks to your holy name, to praise you, and to exalt you in the congregation. Lord, we ask now that we would be mindful of your will, your truth, your commandments, that you would assist us and help us and anoint us to have a walk worthy of our calling, one that manifests your holy name to others. Lord, we intercede tonight for Australia, all the fires, those who have lost life, both individuals, people, and such a great loss of human and animal life as well. And Lord, we intercede and pray for that nation and the citizens of that country. Lord, assist them. We pray that you would put out the fires, that you would move and bring about uh, peace, stability, and return things to the way they were. Lord, we know that we are all living in turbulent times. Things are changing. We know as we approach these last days, things are going to get worse. We know that there will be earthquakes and famines and pestilence and wars and such. So, Lord, we ask that you would give us your perspective on how to live, how to speak, what to do in the midst of these uh, birth pangs that your word testifies to. Lord, we know that indeed things are happening according to what the prophets foretold. And, Lord, in one way we are grieved about the loss of life, the hardship, the suffering, the pain, but, Lord, in another we know that as these things move forward, we know that the great day of your return is drawing near. Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us. Lord, we praise your holy name. We intercede tonight for others who are going through difficult times, those who are sick, 
those who are struggling in whatever circumstances and situation. We pray for healing. We pray for health. We pray for restoration. Lord God, all these things we give to you through our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We do indeed have a God who is faithful. As we prayed a few minutes ago, who will never leave us nor forsake us, those who have entered into a covenantal relationship with him. And one of the ways that we now can, can call out to God is with that term, Avinu, our Father. And what does that mean? Well, one of the implications of God being our Father is that God is our provider. He sees, he knows what we need. For example, in the book of, of Matthew, we see how God knows what the birds of the air needs. He knows about the grass and various plants, and he clothes them all with his glory. He provides their sustenance that they might give fruit. And Lord, we claim that as well. We, as your covenant people, we look to you with thanksgiving, with praise, but also with a faithful expectation that you're not going to leave us, that you don't forsake your covenant people, that you are a holy God, a God of fidelity to your word. And that gives us assurance and confidence. And I share these truths with you because in the passage that we're going to be looking at from the book of Exodus and chapter 16 tonight, we're going to see once more how God provided for his people that he always intended to, and he can do so in ways that we never anticipated, and God can meet our need abundantly. So with that said, do just that. Look with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus chapter 16, and we're going to begin where we left off last week, and we're now ready for verse 13. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 13. The children of Israel are in the wilderness, that desert. They have seen over and over God moving them, leading them, directing them in a place that at first sight, it seemed hopeless. There was not that provision. There was not what they needed. But in the end, God many times supernaturally provided. He met their need. He sustained them, and he did so abundantly and this is going to be repeated now here the children of israel they are hungry and they see no means of provision and therefore they fall into despair and that despair that frustration that doubt that faithlessness manifests itself with complaining and as they do god he responds. Now, oftentimes, God responds with complaints, with his anger. But here, in this time, God, he's growing up a people. He's maturing them. He's manifesting, teaching them. And what does he do? He simply provides. Look with me, as I said, Exodus 16 and verse 13. We read, and it came about, in evening now so much of what god does he does in the evening or at night when we have ended our day god he never sleeps nor slumbers the god of israel he's constantly moving in behalf of his word what he has testified what his word has revealed he's going to do and it says, and it came about in evening that quail, this bird, these flocks of birds of quail went up and they covered the camp. And in the morning, notice, they received these quail, these birds. But in the morning, it says, there was a layer of towel. Towel is dew. 
Now, all of this is coming about to teach us something. Dew in the morning, like rain in the winter, is seen as a blessing. So God's providing, but the context when we read it, knowing the, the literature of Scripture and the means that the Word of God uses to convey truth to us, this is coming about within the context of a blessing. So quail went up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. Verse 14. And that, that layer of tau, that layer of dew, went up and behold. So the dew came, but when it left, it says, behold. Now I would make a note of that because... Behold, it has to do with a word of revelation, a word of pain attention. And this is significant because if you look at some commentators, they will have all types of natural explanations for what we're going to talk about, and that is God's provision of the manna. In Hebrew, man. And they look at it in one way and another but the word of God is clear. Behold, this is something supernatural. As Messiah taught, God rained down bread from heaven. And how did he do that specifically? The word of God is telling us. Look at verse 14. And when that layer of dew went up, behold, upon all the face of of the wilderness or the desert so upon the surface is what the scripture is saying it uses the word pane the face of but it's the surface of the desert the wilderness there was what a thin and rough thin layer of frost upon the earth now they looked at this and they saw this, and it says dak, which is thin. Then we have the word mechuspas, which is kind of rough. And then we have the word kafor, which is frost. So all of this, when the dew went up, this was what was left. And it says it was upon the land. Verse 15. And the children of Israel looked, and they said, a man to his brother, meaning one to another. Man who? From, it is. Literally, we would understand it as, where or what is it? Now, they didn't know from where this had come. Now, the thing that should be pointed out is that this is an unusual occurrence. This is not a normal, a natural happening. It's not something that they had ever experienced before. So when it happened, what did they say? Well, we read, they said, man who? Man, the word men is from. Man can be understood as what is this or where is this from? Meaning, what's its origin? How, how did this be? For they did not know mahu what it was mahu is obviously what it is and moses said to them it is the bread not bread the bread which the lord has given to you for eating so once again giving the way we understand that is divine provision they didn't know it and this is an important truth what they wanted, what they needed, what they desired, food for sustenance. God provided it in a way that they did not know, expect, ever had experienced before. And what God provided was not normal. Yes, they had that quail, but as it said in the morning, and this was going to be something that was consistent. Each and every morning except for Shabbat, we'll get to that in a moment but notice they didn't know what it was god met their need in a supernatural way and god does that for his people 
So they did not know what it was, this bread which he provided. Verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord commanded. And what was that? That they gleaned, that is, they gathered up from it a man according to his eating, meaning gather up what you're going to eat. And they did so, and the measurement, it says here, Omer. That is a particular measurement we'll talk later about at the end of our study when we close up this chapter in a few minutes. So each man was supposed to gather from this man according to his eating, what he ate, and Omer, and then we have the word Gulgolet, that is a skull or head. So each individual, according to the number of heads in their 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 family and here it's according to the number of souls or living beings every man in his tent he is supposed to take so take according to each soul everyone that's in your tent gather up this man for them so it's not a hard instruction they saw a supernatural provision they didn't know what it was. Moses told them, it is the bread which God is giving to you. Go out and gather it up, each one, according to the amount that he eats, according to the number of heads, each individual that lives in your tent, meaning your home, according to your family. Verse 17, and the children of Israel did thus, and they gathered much and little, meaning different people gathered different amounts. There were those who gathered a lot, and there were those who gathered a little. And it says in verse 18, and they measured it according to the omer. And there was not any that remained, those who took much or those who took little at the end. There was none that remained, none that lacked, Every man had, according to his eating, what he had gathered. So we see something. God's provision, it wasn't, and this is a point that oftentimes is ignored or looked over. People went out, and it was not a limited provision. It was limited by time, but not amount. Whatever they needed, whether you wanted much or whether you wanted little. You were supposed to gather that up and consume it all, that nothing was left. But it didn't matter what you took. You took according to your desire, your need, what you would eat, and God's provision was sufficient. It was complete. Verse 19. And Moses said to them, every man... Do not allow any leftover from it, from what you gathered, unto the morning. So they were supposed to, and this is very significant, because this statement, don't let any remain until the morning, or if there is, you have to destroy it. That's very similar to Passover. Passover, what comes into our mind? Redemption. This is food of redemption. Now, when we look, and I caution you now because I'm going off the scriptures and going into some rabbinical material. And the rabbis teach that eating this, this is what they had, and we'll see this, during their time in the wilderness. This was God's consistent provision. And it says here that there was no leftover. They interpret that to mean also there was no waste that came through it. It was purely nutritious. So there was no uh, uh, going to the restroom from, from eating this. All that was provided, it was complete, perfect, holy, heavenly nourishment. It says, and there was not any to remain into the morning. Verse 20. But they did not listen to Moses. And men cause some to remain from what they had taken unto the morning. 
So he says, I don't want, Moses says, God is revealing, and I'm telling you, commanding you, take what you want, eat it all. None should be pre present in the morning, none whatsoever. If there was, and there were some who disobeyed, they weren't what? Walking in faith. They were saying, well, maybe God provided today, but what about tomorrow? I better hold on to a little bit just in case for tomorrow. Now, that may make sense from a rational standpoint, but it's disobedience. God says, and this goes along with, give us this day our daily bread. To focus on our needs today and not be so consumed about tomorrow. But there were some, look at verse 20. But they did not listen to Moses, and men left over, the people left over from it until the morning. And what happened? And there went up, and the implication is, went up from it worms, and also a stench it was foul-smelling. And Moses was angry at them, verse 21. Now, they're going to see God's faithfulness. God, although he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, realize something. God is able to make changes in reality, changes in nature. What happened naturally one day, it may not happen the next. See, this is the nature of God. He does the unexpected from our standpoint he does according to truth, according to his word. Look at verse 21. And they gathered it, baboker, baboker, each morning, a man according to his eating, that is, according to his appetite, what he wanted to eat. Vecham Hashemesh. And when it was hot because of the sun, what would happen to the man, the manna? It says, ve yamas, it would melt. So this teaches something. God's provision was there in the morning. But when the sun came up and got hot, it melted. And that man disappeared. It dissolved. It was no more. It melted. So there was a limited time. God's provision, that thing that he provides for a need, just doesn't remain there. We need to go and take a hold of it, claim it according to the instructions of God. And notice that it was early in the morning. And it was seeking what? Well, in the same way that we seek food early in the morning, we're supposed to seek God. The outcome, if we go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 8 and verse 10, when you have eaten your food and are satisfied, you give thanks. So they came out in the morning together what they needed for the day. They would eat their breakfast, and obviously this was all supposed to be accompanied with praise and thanksgiving and worship of the Lord. Verse 21, And they gathered it each day, a man according to his eating, while it was hot and the sun come up, then the manna would melt, verse 22. And it came about on the sixth day that they would, would glean, gather up this bread, a double portion, two omers for one. Now, one here is for each individual. In other words, on Yom Shishi, that's Friday, Arab Shabbat, the day before Shabbat, tells us something. They were supposed to go out and glean a double portion. Now, this was different. Each and every day other than, than Yom Shishi, Friday, they were supposed to only take enough for each person to eat and consume it from the time that they gathered it until the next morning. In the morning, none was supposed to be there, meaning consume it before you go to bed. But on Shabbat, we see God working. 
And this working, and what I mean by working, moving, manifesting, on Shabbat, God manifested a unique principle. That Shabbat is unique. It's different. See, we can't just look at this day and cast it aside saying there's nothing significant about it because the Word of God over and over testifies of the uniqueness, how God moves uniquely on the Sabbath day. Verse 22, And it came about on the sixth day that they gathered bread, a double portion, two omers for each person, and they would come, who would come? All the leaders, the Nisie, the presidents of each tribe, we might say, of the congregation, and they spoke to Moses. Now, what are they speaking about? Well, what did we learn? We learned that on the morning, anything that was left over from what you gleaned the first day would be foul-smelling and have worms Perhaps a better way of understanding that is maggots within that, that manna. So on Friday, when they took a double portion, and we're going to see that double portion is for Shabbat. Why? Well, notice what the Word of God says, verse 23. And he said unto them, it is what the Lord has spoken. See, they were confused about this instruction together a double portion so moses said to them it is what the lord has spoken shabbaton this is another word for a sabbath a holy sabbath to the lord is tomorrow so moses is telling them you need to realize something that tomorrow today all of this was happening on friday when God gave the instructions, take a double portion, the leaders came and they weren't agreeing with this because of what had happened. These are the ones who came and said, wait, we took more than we needed for one day. And in the next day, it was so stinky and full of worms. We can't eat that. So why are you telling us to take a double portion today? Moses is explaining, because it is a Sabbath, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. And what you bake, bake, and what you have cooked, cook, meaning do that today. And all that uh, is remaining, you set for yourselves for a mishmeret. Now, mishmeret is kind of like a guarding that you set it, it's also a word for like a shift at a factory or a plant. So set it aside, it's designated for a specific time. And he says here, a mishmerit unto the morning. Now this is different because they were not supposed to have any set aside for the morning, but on the sixth day, they were supposed to do that. And verse 24, and they set it aside until the morning, just as Moses commanded. And it said, it did not stink, and there were not any maggots in it. Verse 25. Now, the reason why I translated one time worms and the other times maggots is because in the Hebrew, we have the word, if you go back up to, to the text, you're going to see something. You're going to see that Moses uses a specific word, and I'm talking about verse 20, where it says, Vayarum tolaim. Tolaim are worms. Worms would, would rise up from it. But when we look here, we see a different word, the word rima, and rima here is normally translated by maggots so it says there was no maggots in it verse 25 and moses spoke you shall eat it today for it is the sabbath day unto the lord today you will not fill or literally they shall not find in it 
any of it in the field. So what he's saying is this, God, he keeps the Sabbath. Now, on the Sabbath, God has set forth, he moves, has caused unique things to be on the Sabbath. We're giving an example of one right now. The man on any other day in the morning, it's stinky and full of maggots. But on Shabbat, this was not the case. So God is showing and teaching, keep the Sabbath. Respond to it as my word instructs. So he says, if you go out into the field on Shabbat, you're not going to find any manna. There's not going to be that dew that leaves manna for you to gather up. Verse 26. Six days. Now he's giving the clear teaching. Six days you are to glean. And on the Sabbath day, rest. It is a Shabbat. Lo ye bo. It will not be in it. What won't be in it? Any manna. God's not providing on Shabbat for the sake of Shabbat any provision. He's going to provide it on the sixth day. A double portion they are to take. And God provides specifically in light of his Shabbat truth. Notice verse 27. And it came about on the seventh day. Now Moses, I mean the people, it's not that they're confused. It's not that they don't understand. The teaching is simple. Small children can understand this. On Shabbat, don't go out. There will not be in the field, any manna. God's not giving it on Shabbat because of Shabbat. He is going to have the people take a double portion on the sixth day. So on the seventh day, they don't go out. They can remain at home and enjoy that, that second portion that they gleaned on Friday. Friday is a day of preparation for Shabbat. But notice what it says. In the verse 27, let's read the whole verse. Vayihi beyom hashvi'i, and it came about on the seventh day. Yatsu min ha'am. The people went forth, they went out, lilkot, to glean, to gather up. And notice something. They did not find. Why not? God had told them over and over, there's not going to be any, you will not find any. On the Sabbath day so this is clear that God is moving he's keeping and he's requiring them also to keep the Sabbath day let's move now to the last part of this chapter beginning with verse 28 and the Lord said to Moses unto when you are refusing to keep my commandments and my Torah. Now I underlined and highlighted that because that's a good question for each of us. Each of us need to ask ourselves until how long are we going to refuse, ignore the commandments of God and his instruction. By the way, we're talking about mitzvot taive Torah ti. Very important that we see this, this term here. Let's look at it again. He says, how long are you going to refuse, refrain from keeping mitzvot tai and literally tai? Now, why is that important? What's the difference between Torah ti, which I said first, and Torah tai, which I said second? Well, Torah ti is singular my torah my instruction but it's actually in the plural which would mean my instructions we see a correlation between the commandments being taught to us as god's instructions given to us and he instructs us for a reason that it would be well with us that we would manifest our covenant relationship that people would see our 
personal commitment to God and his commitment to us. It would be a testimony. Verse 29. See that the Lord has given to you Shabbat. Here again, another verse that we should, should understand, comprehend, underline, and see the great significance. God says here, see, for the Lord has given to you the Sabbath. Now, God is instructing Moses to say this. Therefore, he has given to you on the sixth day the daily portion, meaning a double portion, that portion for, for two days, a double portion or two-day portions. He says, let every man dwell in his place. Now, over and over, when we read the scripture, we see the scripture is written down in its order, its word order and such, in order to be a source of divine revelation. And when we look at this, it just jumps out to me when I look. Shevu ish tachtav. Every man, let him stay in his place. Now, what this teaches us is one of the blessings of Shabbat. It teaches us that the purpose of Shabbat, what God wants to do, is to put us in the right place, where we need to be, where God wants us to be located. And this relates to one of the outcomes and purposes of Shabbat. And that is, remember what the scripture says, Man was not created for Shabbat, but the Shabbat was created for man. Meaning the Shabbat has a purpose for human beings, for humankind, not just Israel. Israel was given, to, given the Shabbat in a unique way, but to be an example to the world. We see the Shabbat all the way back being spoken of in Genesis chapter 2. So when we read here, we see that Shabbat is an instrument of restoration. It helps us. It takes us to where God wants us to be, in what condition and what location. He says, do not let a man go forth from his place. Now, it's two different words here. We have the word taktaf. I translate it in his place. And then we have, and what I did, I wrote up above. Bimkomo. It says, let him stay in his place. Let him do not go out from his place. But it's the word makomo, his place. Two different words, same meaning, but God's using parallelism. It's a poetic form. And this change in words using two is to emphasize this location, what God wants to do. And he says, let this be done. Stay in your place. Don't leave from it. When? Be'yom ha shavii. Now here it doesn't say Shabbat. It says the seventh day. And the seven, that number relates to holiness. And holiness speaks to the purpose of God. When you are where you're supposed to be, God is going to reveal to you his purposes. You need to be located in the right location in order to hear and understand the purposes, the revelation of God. Verse 30. And the people, we could say, did the Shabbat. They rested. They did the Shabbat on the seventh day. Verse 31. And the house of Israel called its name. Now, we're going back to what? Man, manna. And why do we do this? Well, what was manna? It was a supernatural provision. It came in a unique way, way that the children of Israel did not anticipate, never heard of before. It was something new and different. And now we're seeing that manna and Shabbat, so much teaching about the Shabbat, in light of this giving of the manna. Why? Because Shabbat, 
when we apply Sabbath truth to our life, it is going to be a source of supernatural provision. So the word of God says, and the children of Israel called its name Man. It is as a seed. What type of seed? A white seed of, I wrote down, cilantro. Now, some of your Bibles will say coriander. I didn't know what that was. Did some research, and it's a form of what is more common today, cilantro. So that's how it looked. It was a wafer. It was kind of rough or coarse. And we see here that it was like cilantro, that is white, but its taste, look at the end of verse 31, vetamo, its taste was like a wafer in honey. So it had a good taste like honey. And all of this, most commentators say the taste reminded them that they were on a journey, that they were on a journey to the land of, of milk and honey, that this had a purpose attached to it, and that was to bring them to where they needed to be. And that's what God's provision is for. It's not for you to accomplish what you see as your your dreams and your desires but it's for you to get where god wants you to be so that you can do what god wants you to do now i want to pause for a moment because i was listening to a message uh, uh last night when this is being recorded but uh when you're seeing it a few weeks ago and this instructor he's a a bible teacher and he was talking about sin and the reason why I bring this up is his view of sin and what I would say the biblical view of sin are very, very different. Now, he said it's easy to understand the biblical definition of sin. Sin is something against you or against your spouse, your children, your friends, your neighbor, your whoever you come in contact with. So it's against the world. A sin is something that is against something in the world. Now, what did he leave out? I'm not saying that, that his definition is 100% wrong, but it leaves out the heart of the issue. The main aspect, first and foremost, sin is not against me. First and foremost, sin is against God. And here's the problem. And I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to, to hopefully straighten things out in light of the Word of God. Not what I think, what I come up with, but what the Word of God does in fact reveal. See, if I leave it, sin is something against me. Well, it all puts it upon my perspective, what I think is against me what I think is harmful to someone else or whatnot. It puts me in the driver's seat. I determine what is sin. Very, 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 very dangerous. It's disastrous. No, to know what sin is, we have to look at God's word. And it's a violation of his will. It is something first and foremost against God. Now, does it adversely affect God? No, it adversely affects us. But there is a very significant difference. At the heart of the issue is God, not man. See, when I put myself as the, the main thing, if it's against me, or against someone I love, someone I like, someone I, I'm near to, someone I work with, someone that I come in contact with, it makes it all about what? Me. It shouldn't be. Sin is a violation of the will of God, something against his purpose, his word. And what we see here, and the reason why I bring it up is the children of Israel, they're supposed to be doing things according to God's will. They're not on a journey to where they want to be, 
They're on a journey to where God's taking them. It's his will, his purpose. And when they move away from his will, his purpose, his instruction, his commandments, that's what is sin first and foremost. Does it have an adverse effect upon individuals? Obviously it does. But we need to understand it from the right priority. God's the priority. Verse 32. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer, meaning fill with an omer, that measure for a mishmir, that that, uh, uh, setting aside, that watch. Remember, the mishmir was that that shift at a plant or factory, something set aside, usually related to, to time. So he's saying, you set aside a a portion of this manna as for your generations on account that they will see the bread which I fed you with in the wilderness, in the desert. So here, God is instructing Moses, according to the command of the Lord, take an omer of manna. And set it aside, Mishmeret, set it aside throughout your generations as an image so that the children of Israel can see what the Lord fed you in the wilderness when I brought you from the land of Egypt. So when God, through Moses, but when God brought them from the land of Egypt, Here again, exodus from Egypt, redemption. What is being shown? A connection between redemption and God's provision. See, do not expect God's provision in your life unless you've experienced his redemption. Now, this is so important because oftentimes people want to teach biblical principles, biblical truth to a non-believer. Saying, you know, you're not a believer yet, that's okay, just try these things. They won't work. Why? God's faithfulness in regard to his commandments, first and foremost, they are for his people. So we should not expect provision if we have not experienced redemption. But when we have experienced redemption and entered into a covenant with the Lord, we can expect. God to be faithful to his word and provide, never leaving nor forsaking us. Verse 33. And Moses said to Aaron, take one jar and set there one full measurement of of an omer, of manna, and lay it before the Lord as, here's the third time, mishmered, for a a purpose what's that purpose to keep it for a period of time it's a mishmeret keep it as an observation throughout your generations verse 34 just as the lord commanded moses aaron laid it before the testimony meaning the ark of the testimony for the fourth time mishmeret for this uh uh purpose, this observation for this purpose. Now, some people will want to make a, a mess, make, make mention that it says here before the, the Ark of Testimony. But when we get in the book of Hebrews, it says it was in the Ark of the Testimony. Well, to me, there's not a real problem with this. Because it was before it, but later on, apparently it was placed inside. Now, one of the things that we can anticipate is when the ark was, was, was hidden, probably that's when that, that manna was placed inside. Secondly, we have here that it was one jar In the book of Hebrews, it says that it was a golden jar. It doesn't say what it was. It doesn't mean that it can't be golden. And obviously, it was. 
verse 35. And the children of Israel ate the manna for how long? 40 years until they came to the land of, of their dwellings. And the manna they ate until they came to the end or the border of the land of Canaan. It's the end, meaning where the land of Canaan begins, its border. And we read verse 36. And the omer was one-tenth of an apha. it is. Now, let me simply close by saying this. When we look here, we see all of this is what's being done. In fact, if you go back up, we see beginning in verse 32, God began to say, I'm doing this, and I want it to be for a memorial so that the people can remember my faithfulness, my provision. And all of this came within the context, much of the scripture, the Sabbath day. And notice that in the end, it was to bring them to their biblical destiny. See, all too often how that word is used today, destiny, it's just our wants, usually selfish, fleshly, carnal wants. And we repackage that and we call it our, our destiny. Not the case. Biblical destiny relates to God's will. It's not what I come up with. It's what God must reveal to me for me to understand it. And I come to know it through obedience. So God here, through his provision, what the scripture says, for 40 years he provided them while in the wilderness until that right time, his time, when there was that new generation that, that was cut off from the Egyptian experience, Egyptian knowledge. And they learn their new heritage was the wilderness. What does that mean? Trusting, depending upon God. And it was this trust, this dependence that caused them to get to the place at that border of the land of Canaan. God in this passage reveals many principles for us so that we can apply them to our life, implement them in our behavior so that we can experience his provision, his sustenance, and his direction moving us to where we need to be in order to be his servants. The last thing I'll say is this. 40 years, 40 years is a number of transition. And what I want you to realize is this. When you apply biblical truth, this truth that we've learned today, when you apply it to your life, there's going to be a godly transition in your life. You may feel frustrated. You may feel that you're, you're not where you're supposed to be, that you can't break through. You can't see that change that, that you need. That's right. Until you begin to apply the truth of just this text today to your life, you're not going to have that, that transformation, that transition, that change that you truly, your soul, the neshama within you, that spirit within you is crying out for. It comes through applying biblical truth to your life and you can be assured changes will come. Well, I'll end with that until next week. Shalom from Israel.